I thought we'd do a run through of the plans talking about the proposal. We've already put up a fly through of the before and after of the proposal, but the plans tell much more of the story around the interior spaces. Um, we did find the historical map of the original site, which I'm going to talk through a little bit, um, capturing the screen as we're talking. So hopefully it'll, it'll work to be able to illustrate a little bit more around what was originally on the site um, and then talk through the project itself and the, the design of the proposal, proposed buildings. Yeah? Yeah. What you're looking at here is a historic map of the airfield uh, about six months after it was constructed. Um, and this was in the RAF archives and it was top secret until so we got it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know when it, when it failed to not be top secret. But anyway, this bit in the centre, if you see the mass, is what we own, I guess. No trees? We're, we're no trees. The trees didn't exist. And now, the, the base was split up over several areas. So this here, here, here and here were all kind of residential areas or barracks. So this is where airmen slept, flight officers slept. Is that the bunkers? Yeah, that's that. But that again, it is a re it's at site number four, which is a residential site, or re I say residential barracks basically. So you got four barracks. You've got this, which is the communal site, which is what we own, which basically had the the mess the messes for the sergeants, which is this one. Who's in the it? Off the, I wouldn't have said the officers, which is that, and the, and the airmen, which is this. Plus uh, other sundry buildings, which I'll talk through in a bit. But up here is the technical site. This is basically the airfield. You can see the airfield plotted there, strips plotted out here. And this was the hangars, the engineering bits and pieces and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is the kind of main road cutting through it, which we come off, which is called the Slane. Um, if I zoom into this now, into the communal site, um, shift it back. Uh, right, so again, this is the communal site. I'll zoom in a second a bit more so you can see it. But beyond this kind of perimeter of woodland here, this is Harlockston Hall Manor. Manor, sorry, yeah. So this is all grade one listed, and the gardens are grade two listed. So this is our nearest neighbour, in effect. Um, incidentally there's fragments of this left but nothing left of anything else and there's fragments of these buildings left one of those buildings I think is Compliance House on yeah it is the, it, the, they've the, been converted from yeah the project's roof I'm not it. sure which one yeah. it is yeah so there's, but there's fragments the most complete really is is what's left on the communal site which is what we own if I zoom in a little bit now, there we go. Let's clear it up. Right. So this is the DMU or DMC, uh, Decontamination Centre, um, and this this is the building that is still standing, and this is the standby set house which is still standing. So these are the two still standing structures. The foundation exi exists for this building here, which is the Evans Mess. This, which is a local produce shop, this is gone, which is the NAFI, and I think it had accommodation for airmen in it. Um, this was the airmen's shower block and the airmen's latrines. The foundations are still there for both of these. This was a small medical unit, uh, which the foundation still exist. This was the sergeant's shower block, and this was the sergeant's mess. Over here was the um, officers' mess, was it? Flight officers' mess, yeah, and shower block. Oh, they didn't call it shower block; they called it a uh, bathhouse. Clearly, if you're an officer, you had a bath, not a shower. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a picket post here, and there's a road that runs round, concrete road, and there's a road that comes through. Now, what's it, what's left here is the foundations of all these buildings, um, and the roads. They've been partially, the concrete has been partially removed in this area. 
to try and help fly tipping in, in, in the 60s and 70s, I think. Uh, but there's that much hardcore under the roads, you wouldn't know. So this is the main thoroughfare in which still exists in all its concrete glory. And this piece still exists here. But this little chappy here is the is a water tank, an open water tank, which was there for fire. And this is the fuel dump, uh, standard issue fuel dump, um, where they basically would have just dumped loads of coal. The main heating for the whole site for every building was coal. So it was either open fireplaces or kind of boilers or whatever, but it was coal. Um, and we're plant so you get a kind of progression of buildings. So sergeants, officers, airmen. And then within this, you have uh, these ancillary buildings, such as NAFI, which is a kind of, if you, if you know anything about army, it's, it's kind of an army shop where you buy your tobacco and all sorts of things like that. Local produce shop. Um, this little chappy here, I can't remember what that's from. Um, so that's generally the layout we started working with. So we discovered this and we thought, okay, well, this point, the original planning application basically ran a road like this around here and created this, a site area in about here. So we've abandoned all of that. We're keeping this road. We're using that as a marshalling space. And we will probably widen this road because it's only, it's an eight foot concrete, it's eight or nine feet concrete road and it's in pretty good condition but we will widen it slightly to 12 foot so we can get <coughs> fire 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 engines down there and things like that which we need to do um so the so what was interesting when we discovered all of this was was really discovering the roads um they're still all here this one's here this is here this is here this is here that's there um we had no idea that this really existed until we found this map. You could see fragments of it, and we knew there was a concrete, concreted area here. We actually measured it. We figured that out, and we figured the road kind of continued down. But we didn't realise it was so pin straight, and we didn't realise it. We had this big turning circle area. We didn't realise about this junction and all sorts of things. It's provided really good access as well during even the clear site clearance and stuff because it turned into quite a, a muddy patch during yeah. uh, a couple of months ago when, when a lot of the trees were being taken down. And uh, this is just... But really it allows huge. fairly big trucks on site yeah. with, with ease. I mean, we had a big eight-wheeler come on site and turned around quite happily here. So uh, it, it, from, our pers from a building perspective, it's ideal because it provides ac site, site access um, to every point on the site, really. So you can come around the front of the DMU... You can park big trucks there and you can reverse out and come back out again. So we can we so when the concrete delivery guy turns up, we're not gonna need a huge pump. We'll be able to park pretty much next door to it and take it straight over the concrete. Yeah. Cost saving? Definitely a cost saving. So this is so this gives you this is what was there. What's interesting is the, the buildings that aren't there anymore, but their foundations are there. All these are there as, in terms of foundation, with the exception of this one. Uh, what's interesting about that is that they're all listed as temporary structures in, the, in the, the manifest that goes with this plan. So if you notice, they've all got little numbers on them. And they're, temporary stru they're listed as temporary structures. And we did a lot of research. There's some, some Bod wrote a PhD on on temporary wartime structures. And we think they were probably a mixture of brick and steel. Um, and panel, pre like a prefabricated lightweight panel. Prefabricated lightweight steel panels. you were panels. saying, if, if they yeah. were all brick, there'd still be a lot of brick on site, which there isn't. Yeah, if they have been concrete or brick, we, we can still be there, because it has no value. But the steel did, and I suspect somebody removed it. Kind of... One of the other interesting things about that as well, though, was that there wasn't any um, evidence of there being missing huts on this site, which was no. originally part of the original planning application. Um, but but would... we've ascertained from measuring the foundations that these very clearly fit within the parameters or the measurements of foundations of those temporary structures that we understand were there. Yeah, the, what happened was in 1939, they standardised all construction, all the RAF did. So 
each each one of these each one of these concrete platforms is, has a standard width. Not, not this one and not that one, but these are the ones. They all comply to three standard widths, and they're all made up of these three standard widths. And those standard widths only came in in thirty nine, <clears throat> so we know it must have been built post thirty nine. Uh, 1940, I think it was around then. Um, in, and what we also know is that Nissan huts weren't erected in the UK until after 43, when the shipping lanes opened up again. All other Nis all Nissan huts were exported to um, theatres abroad, um, particularly North Africa and Southeast Asia, because they were quick to erect, easy to transport, things like that. So, but they didn't use them locally. So what we've so and so locally there was a kind of scramble there was no timber because the timber we at this point the uk imported 100 percent of its timber and it got it basically from the places it gets it from now which is canada and norway but those shipping lanes were closed down for three years basically so there was no real timber this forced concrete plinths to be built uh, because normally they would have just done you know, a floating timber floor with a perimeter brick wall which the tin floors would sit on so that wasn't that couldn't be adopted um, so they used concrete and it's the first time really you started getting this modern technique of casting a slab and building off it um, and then on top of that they, they only really had they only had a few choices in terms of materials bricks actually fell into short supply very quickly because effectively in 39 the whole of the building industry was shut down in terms of residential construction, which is where the majority of bricks are being used. So all the big brick manufacturers went out of business. So they they were scrabbling for even for bricks at some point. So what we found on the site is there's evidence of the chimney stacks being in fireplaces being in brick, perimeters being in brick, but then refilled with con with concrete. What we didn't find was any kind of evidence of mass use of bricks for low walls or things like that. That stuff would have stayed on site. It wouldn't have gone off site. So it's not there. Uh, so then you start thinking, well, what else could it have been? And actually, when you kind of flick through the archives, you discover that there was several prefabricated systems that were developed very early in the war. Uh, in 19, 1940, and the majority of one was, was steel, basically. So steel for the roof, steel for the lightweight structure, girders, things like that, and then steel for the walls. They must have been cold and noisy, but pretty sure that's what they were. There's no real evidence of anything else. If it had been concrete, brick, anything like that, it'd still be on site because uh, it has no value. Steel does. It's not on site, but the foundation's there. So that's that's what we think was here. And all of these buildings were had very low pitch roofs. Um, and they were kind of pretty standardised. There wouldn't be looking things. They, but they, were, they weren't Nissan hoods. That's the key. But built uh, like for efficiency of construction. Yeah. Like you were saying about the um, pre-made, uh, pre prefab concrete roof on ours. Yeah, the the, cool. the 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 planks, the reinforced concrete planks on our on, our, on, on the two existing yeah. building, both buildings, they were they was they were quite the innovation at the time. Uh, they have got a name, I forgot what it's called, um, and they weren't really, and they they were. It was one of the first times they were actually used. It's interesting when you look at the, what's left there in terms of construction, in terms of the bricks. What's interesting is that. There's patches of fired bricks, there's patches of rubber, rubber, rubber bricks, things like that. And so these buildings have kind of deteriorated depending on the quality of the materials that were used. Um, what's interesting is, we, we wanted to look to the foundation video, but effectively the construction was to just bulldoze out down to, 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 um, to rock uh, uh, and then build up from that um, and that's how they've, they've been constructed these were listed as permanent structures so they they were seen to be surviving them they were seen to be permanent structures they were built as permanent structures so they couldn't just be so if a, if, a, if, if the base was bombed and gassed there are there are blast trenches here 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 and here only these two survive mind you yeah. And these blast trenches are where you'd escape to, and then if there was gas, you'd, you'd basically come into this building. But 
But these, but this, these both buildings were designed to withstand a, a thousand pound bomb at a given distance. Um, so they were, they were, they had a specification which meant they should survive. So if there's a gas attack, you can still be treated. Uh, still may have energy. You still have energy and all the rest of it. One yeah. of the cool things, though, I think we're going to do is try to reuse as much of those concrete roof prefabricated roof. Well, yeah. As possible. So we're going to be doing some stress testing on another video of of one of them with the engineers who want to actually take one of them and load it up to you know to see how much load it can take. So yeah, because it, it's likely we're going to have to uh, cannibalize one building to repair the other. So likely it is that the the beams or, or the planks will come off the, the standby set house to basically repair the. Uh, the, the DME, which is, the, there isn't, there's a big hole in it from where the chimney was pushed over or the snorkel was pushed over at some point. Um, so we need to repair that. Plus there's a couple of spalled beams, which are planks, which which could do with being replacing. Plus we need to figure out how, actually how strong they really are. And so, we're raising the roof on grandma's. Yeah, well, So we'll I'm, be taking them off anyway. We'll be taking them off anyway, yeah. So... Uh, we've got to remove a lot of steel structure in there. It was, it was designed to move, like the the big the generators and stuff around underneath. Um, but it, it's handy to have the two buildings because it means we can actually, by cannibalising one, we can save and retain more of another one. Because um, actually, the concrete planks internally, we're not going to we're not we will paint them because they've actually been graffitied, but we won't be covering up with plaster or anything like that and we'll treat the we'll treat the services in the in the ceiling exactly as they were treated which was everything was really conduit and things like that so that's how we'll deal with the, the ceiling in there okay talk do you want to talk a little bit through the existing plan of the um dmu yeah yeah okay okay Okay, so this is the existing DMU or decontamination centre, I think it was actually. It's DMC, not DMU. Um, it's kind of an interesting building. It, it, when I first saw it, I was kind of, it kind of puzzled me a lot because I, I couldn't figure out exactly what on earth was going on in it. However, after quite a bit of research, and the original planning application didn't really get into how this properly went. They made lots of assumptions, all of which were wrong. And they got it, and, and so and it caused more issue for us trying to figure it out than it did actually kind of shed light on things. But essentially, it works, it's a fairly straightforward little building. Um, you've got two entrances here now. The assumption was that one of these was male, one was female. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, this one here was for able bodied individuals, and this one here was for the wounded. And the first element you enter is this which is covered but it's basically a bleach bath to, to basically bleach your shoes as you're coming through um, and then you enter a kind of changing space here and there's toilets in this changing space so there's a toilet here and there's a toilet here um, now both of these toilets are the kind of continental style crouching toilets and also these these areas are, are all rendered rendered right up to the ceiling and they have drains in the floor and they have hatches at this end and the idea was that you came in you shed your clothes everything that went out the hatch if you use the toilet you go there and then you marshaled at this point here and the same you'd be brought into stretch and stripped probably the stretcher bearers would strip as well all the stuff would go out and then you'd, you'd wait at this point and this point is basically an airlock so this is a very long airlock so you can kind of walk into it with a stretcher and two, two, two individuals either in, and this is a much shorter airlock. So you move through the airlock and you come into the main shower space here, or decontamination space, which is all of this. So you come in with a stretcher. This was a, I sus this was a kind of annex room to this space, which I suspect had medical supplies in it. And this was the exit out, which again is a long airlock. Now, I did just mention the render. Now, the interest, the reason this is rendered is so it can be decontaminated, so it can be hosed down completely, and that's why they have the crouching toilet, so the whole thing can be hosed down. 
when you come into this space, this is only rendered up to kind of just below head height, which is basically the height at which you need it waterproof for, sh for showers. This is the central shower, which basically you had planks across it or vertical walls. So you queue on this side, go in, come out that side. Um, and here we think there was a hose pipe basically. We were just hose down in this area. Now, there's been a bit of conversation about what exactly this weird little space was about. Past, I've heard some people say that it was a female shower, but actually there's no evidence of shower fittings being in this. And this has a little label on it, which I forget what it was. It's called... It's batteries. It's got three letters. We'll, 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 we'll that post, figure that, post figure that one out, yeah. But none of it suggests that this is a shower. So... I, my suspicion is that it was either chemical storage or this was a very particular shower. I'm not entirely sure what. But I don't think it was male or female. I don't think there was a gender split at all on this. It was just like, you're covered in mustard gas. Who cares whether it's male or female? Let's just get rid of the gas kind of thing. Anyway, so once you've gone through the showers, you get to this point. And you'd be given basically um, a towel, presumably, and fresh clothes. Um, within this area, if you're on a stretcher, you would probably be covered with blankets and stuff like that, which would come from this. And you'd be taken out through this long airlock here. Um, this was kind of the administrative centre as well. So there was two desks either side here. And you can see the marks on the walls still. Um, you collect your supplies and you get changed, and there's, there was loads of benching in here. You can see all the bolt, bolt holes in the floor. You can see where all the benching was in this area, and there was a toilet here. And once you got changed, you'd leave by this small airlock here. Um, <coughs> the last two spaces, these three spaces, rather, this was where the air was sucked in. So this is the air handling unit. This in the corner is basically a chimney or a snorkel, which went at least six metres above the height of the roof of the building and basically was the air intake. So it sucked the air in through here into the air handling unit and all the air handling was pushed down this side. So all the, all the air ducting is down here. And this pressurised this area. So you had positive pressure in here and slightly negative pressure in here. But I think what they actually did was they pressurised the whole space so, including including these two areas. What, to like push out the must any? Yeah, so it was all pushed in. Air was pumped into the space as well as this. Because like mustard gas, that would hang lower in the air, like it's heavier, is it? It's heavier than air, which is why, which is why the, the snorkel is six metres high. Um, so that's how they pressurised it. The other interesting thing, going back to the render. Okay, so it's head out here. When you pass this point, there is no render. So they obviously felt they didn't need to decontaminate, that they wouldn't have to decontaminate this area. So there's a kind of different use of materials through it as well, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, so this is the air handling unit room. We know this because we've seen photographs of one that exists <coughs> or has the air handling unit still in it, I should say. And this is the boiler room for the shower. So this was a big, a big water tank sat on here. The boiler was here and there was a chimney here which went up to about three metres above the roof line. This, we think, was a st storage for oil. We think this was oil, not coal. There's no evidence that this was, there was any coal bunker attached to this. <coughs> it was all, it was definitely powered by oil. And we think this was an oil tank. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so it's a fairly straightforward little building. Um, I mean, there's still... The only thing we really don't fully quite get is what that is. I mean, it could have been a female shower, but there's no evidence of shower fittings in there. It could have been storage, it could have been hose pipes. We honestly don't know. This is a building type as well that, yeah. like Richard said, there <clears throat> there is a few of these still existing on other sites, which we haven't visited, so we might find more clues when we, yeah. we well, see one of, one of them we can't visit because it's been turned into a bat sanctuary. Ah. Okay. And the other one, um, it's 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 as denuded internally as this one. So 
I don't know whether we'll find it. Or also, not. just a side note to reference the trees, you can see on this plan, this was the original survey showing tree locations. So the circles that, are that, just that, around the outside. That circle is a tree trunk. Yeah, so, so the circles that, and the, um, so the trees, one. yeah, they get it. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> so there. those trees <coughs> we were in planning um, allowed to Remove. take down because they're essentially growing out of the sides, you know, just, yeah. with, just next to the building. Um, we have to f where they found yeah. cosy little spots down by the yeah. concrete. What's well, interesting though, after 50 years, I mean, there's, there was a tree we felled here which was definitely 50 years old. Um, and one here that was about 30, 40 years old. And here, 50 years old. What we discovered was that the only damage from the trees is two pieces. This wall here has been pushed over slightly. And this wall here. And we think this, there was, there's a tree grew there we think what happened is because this is a basement so you're down three or four steps here and we think what happened was pressure against because there was no earth or anything on the other side of this um, it basically got pushed slightly so that that we're gonna have to not really do much with that it'll probably it'll probably be fine as it is we just have to straighten it up with the cladding internally and externally but that but after 50 years of tree growth literally against the building that's the only damage which is quite astonishing but what we're doing with the engineers as well is is literally going around to each element and yeah. ensuring that everything is stabilized literally from the ground up to yeah you know um but we've had a structural survey done originally which was done as part of the planning application so overall it's very structurally sound, um, so mm. you know that's again one of the reasons why the planning was was granted. Because that, that well, was, that's a criteria that sits within paragraph yeah. eighty. So. Yeah. So this is the standby set house, which it will be Grandma's house. You know, quickly mm. run through the plans of that as well. Okay, so you've basically got an open entrance, but this is a blast wall. This is designed to create protection to this inner space, the entrance, and oil storage, which is on these things. Inside, you've basically got um, a network of trenches, which are these things. And then on top of that, at this point and this point, you've basically got a, an engine which drives a generator which sits on here, or vice versa, I don't really know. And the starters for each one, so the smaller versions there. So there's not a lot of light in it, but this, this space is, I think it's five metres high. 4.7 or something. And just to give it a sense of perspective or a sense of scale, the this space here, I think you said was about the same size as the space we're sitting in. Yeah, in fact it might be bigger. So, so it yeah. feels like at the moment when you're in that particular area of the site or of, this, of the building, it doesn't feel as big, but you know, I think it's because of the scale, it's hard to read, yeah. get a sense of the size of it. But And this was the other oil storage area. And this is kind of more interesting because um, and we're going to have to tear this up, unfortunately, because that's where we're allowed to build on. We're allowed to build on top of it, but not to the side of it or whatever. Um, basically, this is a dam. Uh, so these th three things took the weight of the oil tank, which is probably just a big square tank. And if it was burst, basically this is a moat which or moat wall which protects it and there's a drain in here which drains through to this area which is even lower and we think there's another drainage pipe leading away from this and dumping which would dump the oil somewhere away uh, out of harm's way as it were um, the other thing again we have the contamination we had mm. to do a contamination report on this and the buildings were never used um no, there isn't. So there isn't any evidence of oil or any spillage, you know, anything like that, which I think is another thing to consider if, you know, you're doing mm. your own project, that actually all of these things clock up in terms of planning, checks and balances and yeah. ensuring that your site is, you know, viable. And then things like costs increase if there's uh, contaminants because you've got to clean them up and do it all. Yeah. So, that, but, so we've been pretty lucky, I think, on all of that, those fronts, haven't we? Uh, yeah, uh, not so lucky on the water though. Not so lucky on the water, but that's another that's another chapter, another yeah. story. Okay. Do you want to go to the proposed? Good. Yeah. Okay, so this is our proposal, or oh, the ground floor proposal anyway. Um, we, I, when I was designing this, I kind of took a view 
that really, to kind of turn this into a habitable space, you couldn't necessarily keep the configuration that was there. Uh, well, you couldn't, actually. It was impossible. So, based on that, I decided to just kind of see see where my design nose took me. And what, but what I did want to do was try and preserve as much of the kind of external character as possible. So rather than kind of creating these as vestibules, I kind of left them exactly as they were. The openings through here will be opened up to be glass. Um, and I've kept, I've kept, put, kept windows fairly, fairly minimal. I could, you know, I could have put windows all over the place, but I didn't, I just had two big windows. It's we want to do those as potentially big rotating. They will be rotating, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll be centre hinged doors. Uh, so the hinge will be about a third of the way along and they should be single doors. So the back end will come into about here and the outer end will be over here somewhere. They'll be big boys. So they'll be big wings. Uh, in terms of what we removed in terms of the structure, that's the original opening between the shower space, which is here, and the injured space, which was here. So that opening isn't changing. What we've done is we've pulled that wall out, this piece of structure out, so we're going to have to put structure back in. We've also dropped the level of this area by effectively 600, uh, which gives us, but when it all gets laid back up, gives us a floor to ceiling of about three metres. So that'll be about three metres in there. And so you'll have steps out at that point. The ingress out will be via steps and the steps down, which is what this is here. Um, but anyway, let's let me talk through a bit more sensibly. So you you we we've we've effectively kept the exit door for the for the injured personnel is the entrance door. Um, we've removed some of the structure which created that created that uh, the airlock uh, to open up into a kind of vestibule hallway uh, with the usual things. So you have a toilet. Uh, the kind of small utility space for all the plant, all the plant paperwork. Plant room, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've also kept the the sunken area as well, which becomes a kind of secondary entrance, boot room space, utility room, and and, the ext and we've created an, ex an extension on the ground floor, which is this space here, which is basically to house our children who were desperately trying to get out of the house. Now they're in their twenties. So we figured we'll push them outside, might encourage them to go somewhere else. And then at some point, we can turn that into a small studio for ourselves. But, don't tell them that, though. No, don't tell them that. But I'll be emotionally traumatised. Yeah. So um, that's, that's, that's the kind of 20-something uh, accommodation. <laughs> the motel. Yeah, the motel. Um, and then we have a kind of, we have a room here which could either be a bedroom or a second lounge. Um, this was kind of put in because in the end I honestly didn't think I was going to get any kind of modification on the planning so I, I put this in thinking that this would become our master bedroom but it turns out they were quite happy with the great big lump I put on top um, so anyway there's a stair up and that takes you oh that's the kitchen by the way and this is the lounge space and dining space Space. And in that space as well, you'll be able to see right through the, like, to the landscape on either side. So yeah. that's like a big move. Oh, I think what's quite interesting with, li with living in this house, which is like really bright, full of light, all the things that clients always ask us to incorporate, you know, loads of glass, lots of natural daylight and sunlight, um, is that it drives us mad probably 50% of the time when it's really sunny, although we have installed blinds here. But in this house, we've intentionally sort of kept this space well, here quite quite moody. No, but we've <coughs> we've learnt our lessons, haven't we? We've which, is, our lesson, yeah. which is the, the kitchen space is actually it's quite acceptable to flood it with light because mm. you kind of want it flooded with light. The lounge space though is a different thing because lounge spaces tend to be evening spaces anyway. Um, okay, there could be day rooms and stuff like that, but majoritively they are actually. But e but even if it's a day room and you want to turn the television on, what we discovered in a house full of glass is that get about watching television during the day. Even in the evening, in the summer, it's hard to see the television. So, And it gets warm. And it gets warm. So we've created like 
a hot, bright space, which is a kitchen dining area, and then a cooler, darker space. I mean, still, this is all glass. It'll still be, but it's all, views this, this end are really cool. Yeah, but, but this is effectively north light. So it'll be a north lit lounge. We're um, feeling this is our music space as well. Yeah. And then, uh, and then it's pretty straightforward after that. I mean, that was a big move, really. But, but um, and everything else really just followed on from... So this is still exist. This is the existing. So everything else has kind of followed on in a kind of functional sense. Um, the, the, I guess the main philosophy is that, which is control of light. So we like... So this is the North Face. So this room, we've put a fairly big window in it. But what we did think was, well, maybe this could become a kind of... Snug. A snug, that's the phrase. Um, with north light, so you could actually watch television during the day and not bother with the television in it at all and just have it as a music room and general socialising space without a television in it, which is... Which freeze I think, up how you lay out the furniture. Yeah, freeze up how you lay out the furniture, yeah. And also, I think it's... it's it, the word, it, Nowadays, I mean, I watch majority... Of, I don't watch television anymore. I just watch stuff on my iPad. So when I watch the television now, it's either because there's a national emergency and you're watching the news or... Or a good movie. Or a good movie. It's, it's unlikely that I'd watch, sit down and watch Ozark. No, I'd watch that on my iPad. Yeah. Um, so it, the, way you, the way we live now, the way we like treat spaces. So really this, 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 the thought behind this, apart from the fact that we might have to have it as a bedroom, was that it becomes that kind of um, snuggy space where you'll watch a movie and as a family and you'll do all that. But then there's this other space where you'll, you'll basically have conversations, listen to music. Nice bit of vinyl. Yeah, so it spills in and out from the dining and kitchen area. But none of it's dominated by this idea of a great big screen. Which maybe that's a personal thing, but well, I think we've learned from experience yeah. of living in an open plan house as well. So this has yeah. got upstairs, it's got the sitting room, mm-hmm. and you've got downstairs. So if you are watching national emergency uh, television upstairs or, or a movie, everyone downstairs is affected by that, you know. So we've got the luxury in this place of, of being able to have multiple spaces that you can yeah. So we got tuck yourself very, away and we've got an enormously big. That is really huge. Uh, Do you want to show the upstairs plan? Yeah, where is it? There it is. Okay, so the stairs that we're in the entrance will come up through a through a double height space, which I think we're going to modify actually. That's going to change, but it's still going to be it's going to be more opened up, I think. And this is a kind of our, our very private sitting room, if you like. So. When the boys are downstairs hugging the television, this is where we come. And off it is our bedroom and ensuite and whatnot. But also it provides access to the roof. And this this is an existing element to the building. It's basically where they, they, they kept a water tank. So to provide a head to the shower, the water is pumped up to this. And presumably it allowed it to become autonom- autonomous. Although all the drainage and all the pipes are at least two and a half metres deep, so they're actually carved into bedrock. Um, so the likelihood of being destroyed in a bombing raid is negligible, but even so, there's a storage tank. So that storage tank is going to become a kind of outside room, fully insulated, but which, which accesses the roof terrace. And to get to it, you have to come through our, our kind of very private lounge. Or our... It's, it's, it's kind of an adult space. <laughs> adult life, the adult band, even though the kids are adults. But yeah, yeah. Well, it'll all be about, that That particular one is about that view over the landscape. Yeah. Um, it's totally private. It will have a very different vibe to the one downstairs. It is sort of northeast facing, so you'll have the morning sun, I guess, which will be really, really great, but also then that roof terrace um, space will provide us maybe with a... Mm. A bar, I think so. For our evening gin terrace activity, <laughs> indeed, and also maybe a, a small kitchen up here as well. So, yeah. if you wanted to do barbecues, this is where you do it, which is kind of handy because 
If you get above a certain height, I'm not too sure. You. One thing, the house we live in at the moment has a roof terrace on the second storey, e equally as big as this. And uh, what's interesting about it, in the evening, the midges don't get up there. They stay much lower, which is quite nice. So you don't get bitten. So I'm kind of hoping that three metres up, we might avoid the midges, but you never know. And the other thing about having a kitchen, kitchenette up there, if you have a barbecue, because one thing about this place that puts us off eating on the roof terrace is that you've got to bring food all the way up there. But Two flights of stairs. Yeah. yeah. And then we've got the master bedroom up here as well. Yeah. So this, is, this becomes a sort of... Almost two houses in one, but it's also it's to do with the division between us and the, and the kids, even though they're not kids. Probably should be gone. So. <laughs> um, they keep coming back. They keep coming back. Yeah. So, um, but it also gives us. But finally, once we do get it onto ourselves, I mean, really, what we were really thinking about is different areas to kind of. Relax, socialise, entertain, eat. The ultimate party house. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's kind of like that as well. Um, and one of the and we we haven't sacrificed much space for say, bedroom. You know, we've kind of kept that really tight. So there's a lot of wardrobe being built in and all the rest of it. But we've kept the space really quite tight, rather than kind of making it enormous when we don't have to. Um, I think that's really important because you do that quite a lot, don't you? Keeping yeah. those sorts of spaces is sometimes clients ask us to do very big mm. bedroom spaces, but for the amount of time you spend, and also storage, I guess that's the other thing that's key. Yeah, I think I think in the end, you're better off having a modest sized bedroom with its own vestibule lounge, which is exactly what we've done. So in effect, it's an enormous bedroom, but um, but you can pull a sliding door and it's a perfectly usable entertainment space, you know. So I think that's, that was kind of our thinking behind that. And then the language we've used, the architectonic language, is very much in keeping with the, with the actual building design itself. The original design, which was kind of brutal. Uh, I mean, the, the standby set hats, you could, you know, that could be a Mies van der Rohe plan. And, so. yeah, and you'll, you'll still be able to read the original structures. So yeah, that was, that was it's important. Yeah, that was very important to us as well. That you, Okay, we're floating this box on the top of it, but you could. But what we wanted was that you could still read that building underneath it. You didn't. It wasn't suddenly masked by being having a whole story dumped on top of it or something like that. It was actually still legible as the building it was, yeah. um, which uh, which was important to us. Um, but we also wanted the space that this offered us as well. I mean, at the end of the day. The site itself is vast, and to, and to kind of put a tiny, tiny building on it, a tiny house would seem kind of very wasteful, to say the least. So, you know, as an opportunity, we had to kind of take advantage of it. But truth is, I put the box on top, never thought for a moment I'd go through planning, and, and there we are, we've got it. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is the conversion of the standby set hats. As you can see, the walls have got a lot thicker because we've, we're wrapping this building as well. Uh, so basically, this is the entrance. You have a long vestibule, which leads you through to this space, which is actually really awkward to deal with, uh, which is a kind of dining space come stairwell. And you can move around into this, which is a kind of lounge, lounge space. And I think it'll end up being two, having two identities. So one side will be television and stuff, and the other side will be slightly different. Um, and then on top of that, of the oil reservoir thing, we're putting the kitchen, ut kitchen, utility room, and the master bedroom above with a back door. So an alternate entrance. Um, the glazed connection. And this is a glazed connection between. Um, and we've incorporated a bedroom on the ground floor because <clears throat> in the future we think that will be necessary. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, the, the, in the end, nothing, this was pure pragmatics getting this to work. It wasn't, it was like all, you get as many design books as you like, but you just have to chuck them out the door. 
at the door, really. It's just like, how the hell <laughs> yeah, do we get this to work to as a sensible set of spaces? Um, and, the, and that's what took up all the time in the design for this. It wasn't really much else. Um, okay, what It's a we big house, though. It's a very big house, yeah. But that this we turned this, instead of having a tiny little connection, say, corridor width, that, we decided to open it right up. Um, currently, Grandma doesn't like... <coughs> open plan spaces too much so we separated the kitchen with this piece of stud wall the idea is that at a later date maybe this can come out so this becomes all one space so this becomes your dining kitchenette and it connects to this living space as well so you have this kind of through through throughput and with a separate utility space off that which we would probably have a door actually um, anyway and then you, you kind of progress upstairs and camera's uh, assistant will sort this out. Yeah, so we come upstairs and you, you reveal a double height space at this point. So this is an area above that dining space, which is which is like double, uh, it'd be about six meter floor to ceiling in there, something like that. And there's a couple of the, these are kind of big enough to be bedrooms, but what they've been turned into is storage for basically clothes and possessions. And then you come to the master bedroom suite uh, with the bathroom and master bedroom and stuff like that. But in the future, this could easily be turned into two well, bedrooms. They're still master bedrooms, aren't they? They're still big enough. Double bedrooms, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's an enormous bed, though. That's a really big bed. So, yeah, these could easily be two double bedrooms. Or it could be a box room with a large bedroom, or it could be an ensuite, suite. Or a study, whatever, yeah. Whatever, really. So this, this, the plan of this has been left flexible. It's tailored to meet the needs of the client at the moment. Um, but it's also been designed to be modified, heavily modified in the future if it needs to be. I think what's quite nice with this one as well, like with that glazed, um, you know, going back to this thing about light, mm. with that glazed little element in there and this portal skylight it drops really interesting dynamic shafts of light into that space it does yeah i mean the skylight opportunities in this see on the other building we didn't want to put skylights in because we didn't want to pump through the the concrete slabs because those if you if you cut them they drop they're just held they're, they're just sat next to each other with a bit of grass so if you start cutting them they'll just fall in so you can't open up, so if you cut them, you're basically replacing the whole ceiling um, or the whole roof structure. So, but in this, we don't have that as a restriction. So we can actually use, so we can, we've actually kept the whole of this facade window free, but there's a skylight here. So you'll get light from above, basically fill, falling into this space and light from this direction through this big window at this end. And then, shafts of light which are kind of north light borrowed light coming in through through this glass connection and again you've got glass glass so there's lots more opportunities to kind of have fun so there's a light play of light with this whereas the other space we we just had to go for the the dramatic you know two massive windows flood lighting it and then kind of very kind of subtle lighting and the rest of it this we can we there's there's a lot less black and white. There's a lot more gradation in the light penetrating the building, and a lot more kind of interplay between the structure and the light. And the light coming in through it, through through the openings. So I think the next layer of design we were talking about was things like the stairs, stair design. Well, there's 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 a whole kind of package of design to do. To do. Um, this is what most clients don't appreciate. They assume like a building regs package, which is, this is planning, next step is regs. They assume the regs package is it. And actually, regs package is not what you build buildings from. That's just um, for regs. Um, what you build buildings from is packages of drawings, working drawings, which are designed specifically to build off. Particularly if you've got bespoke bits. I mean, a lot of, a lot of clients will take from tender stage and work with a builder but increasingly we have clients that will appoint us all the way through because if they want to do a bespoke detail or something a bit funky somewhere mm. you know we do that but on things like the stairs or on 
one-to-one well, stair, details, you can be drawing yeah. one-to-one details. Absolutely, but I mean the stairs themselves, I know for a fact that that'll probably end up as ten drawings at least, mm. at least, um, and the balcony which runs across here. So this is a kind of bridge. This isn't this isn't tradi traditional flooring. So this is a floating lightweight bridge moving across in front of these two spaces and connecting this. That alone and this will generate maybe. Probably end up with 20 drawings. Because it's quite mad when you want to do, like yeah. when we did Alan's stair, um, you had the, the design drawings mm. and then we modelled it in 3D and then you had the actual, I think, did you do the cutting drawings? But you'd have drawings, you know, if I you were getting all things, the all drawings. the fabrication yeah. drawings, which are another layer, like it's, yeah, it's, it's quite mad just to get something made. It, uh, yeah, it takes quite a long time. Hence, where that high-end design, bespoke design, because we can give the time to that because it's us as the client. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, off building is all about money. Uh, most people, you know, the question is do you want to spend you know, 35,000 on a staircase or do you want to spend 2,000 on a staircase and 33,000 pounds on holidays and furniture? And so it becomes We about ask it. ourselves that question as well. I think it's a question. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a common question. I mean, at the end of the day, how much is the stair really worth that much? You know? I mean, it, it, I, I guess in the end... We won't be spending 35000 on the stairs, though, will we, Rich? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. Okay. We've got all the stairs. We've only got two. No, we've got three. What three? Yeah, you got three, but one of them's just timber. Yeah. That'd be like 400 quid. Off the peg. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that, that's kind of brief run through of the design. Um, so hopefully if you look at this alongside the animation, yeah, you'll get, a you'll get much more of an idea now because the animation shows you sort of the, the buildings in their setting, whereas this yeah. talks through the spaces inside. One thing I think is important on both is about that sort of future-proofing idea that these buildings are... Um, suitable for people well, they're, they're, as they, again, another reason why we've got those downstairs bedroom in our place, I guess. Well, they, they are future-proofed in that sense. Then we, we've, we've made sure that, okay, we, we're going to be living in the foreseeable future, but you won't, you're only ever a custodian of a building. You never, you never, you're never the, unless you kind of die and demolish it, you're never going to be the last person to use it. So, it's worth actually building stuff, creating something that has the flexibility to move forward beyond you. Um, it may sound a bit, I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to think about it slightly differently than that, which is that that flexibility makes it more saleable. When you, when That's you positive. To, you know. <laughs> but I do like the legacy of the idea that you, yeah. you sort of pass these buildings on and they become adaptable so that they can be retained. I mean, we're essentially yeah. recycling a building that uh, would disappear if we weren't doing work on it, as, as lots of people are doing, you know. With yeah, I mean, if we weren't doing this, these buildings would just crumble to nothing. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, a ramble, but hopefully you get more of a picture of what's going to be built very soon. Um, and we'll keep you abreast of progress on site in the upcoming coverage and videos and you'll see more of Richard and uh, the lads who are coming back to help us on site over the summer. So like I said, they're not going, don't seem to be going anywhere. They seem to be yo-yoing backwards to, to help out with the build for grandma and for us. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, until next time. Is that all? Yeah, so definitely all. Yeah. It was a bright, bright day when the sun.